All right, everyone. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us here today. I'm Shayla Cook. I'm here on behalf of Cascade Water Alliance. Cascade is a municipal water supplier in King County that provides drinking water to 380,000 residents and 20,000 businesses, schools, and commercial properties. You can learn more at cascadewater.org. We're super excited to be here with you this morning for our 2022 Spring Cascade Gardener Series. Your speaker today is Lisa Taylor, presenting on easy to grow garden plants that benefit beneficial creatures love. Lisa Taylor is a freelance garden educator and author of the Maritime Northwest Garden Guide, second edition, and Your Farm in the City, an Urban Dweller's Guide to Growing Food and Raising Animals. She is passionate about teaching people of all ages how to grow their own food. She offers programs in person and virtually. Lisa's online edible gardening courses for adults, children, and educators can be found at gardenwithlisa.com. There's her little flashcard, perfect. Got to use at least for, one flashcard. There you go. For Lisa, eating is the main reason for growing plants. Cascade Water Alliance and Bellevue Nursery have donated some lovely door prizes. We will draw those at the end. Um, we are recording this presentation. It will be available for two weeks. I will send out the link to everyone so you have that readily available after the presentation and when it's ready, it'll be sometime mid next week, most likely. We're gonna go through questions and answers at the end. So please use the Q&A tool for that so we can track which questions we've addressed and which questions still need attention. We are gonna wrap up promptly at 11-ish, but we are, going to come back on and answer more questions. I know a lot of people have baseball to get to and other uh, people to see and places to be. So, so I do wanna let you go for those that have to go at 11, but for those that don't and wanna stay on and hear the answers to more questions, please do join us. And without further ado, Lisa, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Well, hi everyone. My name's Lisa Taylor. I'm a garden educator, which is, uh, which means I teach gardening. Uh, and my my uh, my real expertise is in edible gardening. As Shayla said, it's all about eating for me. But I started as a master composter, so I I'm really into like building healthy soil and all that. And I worked for about 20 years for a nonprofit. While I was there, uh, you know, I managed a demonstration garden, so I answered questions from folks all the time. And uh, I had a chance to write two books. Uh, Your Farm in the City is my how-to book. So if you're uh, getting started and you wanna start raising more food, flowers, herbs, uh, this is your how-to book. It just covers just about everything. And because I'm a teacher, I didn't give you overload of information, just the things, oh, thank you, just the things you need to know. If you want to know when to, wait, <laughs> uh, for when to gar when to be planting your edible flowers, herbs, and uh, vegetables, the Maritime Guide is like the longtime classic. And I wrote the second edition. Um, it's got, if you've got the older editions, they still work great. Uh, the new one, uh, it just has more tools and an index, which is very exciting. So I teach all ages. Um, uh, it has been a little lonely for the last couple of years, but we're just starting to get out again. And I do in-person things um, every month at Mulbacks, and I'm starting back in working with schools. If you've got a group or something who'd like a garden speaker, think about me. Um, my contact information, gardenwithlisa.com, should be in that handout. Shayla, did everybody get that handout? Yeah, That's an awesome resource, y'all. Uh, I I was just saying I I'm I can make a good handout. <laughs> so uh, if you've got it and you can and you can uh, have it with you or print it up, it's it's great to just refer to. But uh, after we're done and you're trying to remember some of those key points or some of the different flowers or plants, be sure to access that um, that PDF. Uh, uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. So. Today, we're going to talk about how to, uh, uh, all about plants that, uh, which mulbacks? The, the mulbacks. There's only one anymore, and it's the one in Woodenville. 
Um, so um, check out Mulbach's Garden and Home. I do an easy edible gardening uh, each uh, second Saturday of the month. It's free. And I also do a bunch of um, reels and educational stuff for them. Uh, they have been a lifeboat for me during this pandemic. And their, their mission is really turning toward one of garden education. So it's great. Uh, OK, so today it's all about easy easy to grow plants that attract pollinators and support beneficial creatures. Pollinators uh, are beneficial because they move pollen around and they help make our food. Uh, beneficial creatures uh, include pollinators, but also uh, predators and soil builders. So these are plants mostly for the predators and the pollinators. And I realized as I was reflecting on my list, I'm an edible gardener. So I'm always gonna think about the thing you could put there that you could eat. Uh, and I realized my whole list is full of edible plants, except, except maybe one. And I, I'm, I have to look that one up, uh, but they, they do a double duty. They're good for you. They're good for the pollinators and beneficial creatures. What more could you want? So uh, today I don't have any flashcards. Usually I have some fun flashcards. Today I just have a lot of really beautiful pictures and some really cool pictures of insects and other flying creatures. So this is my trigger alert. If you have a problem with flying and crawling creatures, just be aware that there's going to be a lot of pictures of bees, butterflies, and the like uh, in my slideshow. Uh, to start with, though, I, uh, I don't want to just start with a whole bunch of plants. We really need to set the stage. Uh, we need to make our landscape one that is uh, inviting uh, and pollinator friendly or friendly to beneficials. And so, whoops. There. So let's just look at uh, this slideshow. And, and to begin with, and, and this is listed in your handout, these are just some of the basic things you can do to be inviting pollinators into your garden. A diverse planting, lots of different things that bloom all season. So um, you may be a person who falls in love with one kind of plant. And you may be a collector of that plant. People love roses. They love rhododendrons. They love other kinds of things. But think about, uh, in addition to that collection, think about all of the other and different things you can add. The more diverse your plantings, the more like nature they are. Including natives in that diversity is important because our pollinators are many of them native, they live around here, and they're used to having natives to um, use as nectar sources and as places for their young. So um, including natives, natives tend to be very easy care. Uh, there's an awful lot of natives that thrive in shade. And so if you have a mature landscape, think about adding some natives. This is a beautiful Oregon grape. There's the sort of scrubby one that's low growing, but then there are many beautiful cultivars that are larger and they bloom at different times of the year. There's one in my neighborhood that blooms in December and January, stunning in the middle of winter. And then after the blooms are gone, all of the foliage changes color. So in the early spring, uh, that plant is just, it, it is at its most, beautiful. So think about adding some natives and adding the plants that pollinators love. This is an elecampane. It's one of our plant families that I'll be reviewing, part of the sunflower family. And I'll show you things to look for in those types of plants. Uh, we want to eliminate pesticides and herbicides. Uh, this is going to improve our water and our health. Anytime we can improve our environment, we improve our own health because we're connected. Uh, I have included the organic checklist on your handout, and this is, a, this is the best tool I can give you. These are the things we do to make our garden healthy and pesticide free. Uh, it protects us, protects the water, um, and frankly, it makes it easier to garden. I don't know anything about pesticides or herbicides. I don't know anything about them. I've never had to learn about them because I use the tools on the organic checklist 
and my my um, my garden is my yard is healthy and doesn't need anything else. So very quickly build healthy soil, work with nature, put the right plant in the right place at the right time, encourage biodiversity, use the least toxic approach, which is like nothing, do nothing and see what happens. Water wisely, conserve resources, and it's a lot. There's a lot to it. Um, I like to say gardening isn't rocket science. It's way more complicated than that. So learn as you grow. There's so much to know. You can't know it all. So just be learning each season. Use that as a tool as you're starting to think about what to do in your garden. Learn the habits, habitats, and life cycle of creatures. When I started this work, I thought I was going to know all about plants and all the botanical names. And really, that wasn't, I worked with children, and they really were more interested in the creatures. And as I learned from my, te my teachers, they, you know, it was all about, like, what is going on in the garden, not just what is that plant. So here are three pictures of things you might, if you were looking very clear carefully, you might notice. A little egg, hmm, I wonder what that is. Ooh, a very fierce and creepy looking caterpillar. Ooh, that doesn't look like the friend, hungry, very hungry caterpillar to me. And then that, that weird pupa, that chrysalis, that cocoon, what is that? So as I'm working in the garden, I'm noticing these things and I'm looking them up. The internet is great right now. So you, can, you don't even have to pull out six books to figure out that those are the different stages of the painted lady butterfly. So knowing though that uh, insects have different life cycles uh, and that you'll encounter them at different stages of their lives uh, is important because you're not gonna always see the adult. You may see other, uh, other forms of the creature. Knowing what those look like and knowing that they're okay and they're beneficial, it, it's just gonna add to the richness of your gardening experience and it's gonna let, take a lot of pressure off of you because you'll realize, wow, just about everything I'm seeing is good for my, or, you know, it's helpful for my garden, or it feeds the helpful creatures. So you want to include plants that, that provide ho uh, a home and food for beneficial larvae, the babies of beneficial creatures. Uh, a, a mother ladybug or a mother butterfly is not going to lay its eggs in your garden unless it knows that there's good situation for its babies. So with, with ladybugs, the babies eat aphids. That's their only diet. And three aphids is not enough for a, for a bunch of babies that the ladybug is going to let, you know, eggs that will become babies. So having a lot of either food or host plants for the babies will ensure that you get the adults as well. A lot of times the babies are the ones that eat the plants. Uh, so you're gonna need to have, uh, be tolerant of some plant damage. And, you know, we always say, just don't put those plants, if, if it's a host plant for a monarch butterfly, don't put it out front of your house, put it back somewhere where it's not the first thing you see, but it's something someplace in your yard that can benefit the creatures and not be troublesome as far as uh, visuals uh, around your garden design. Provide, think about nectar, nectar, nectar. Uh, anytime we can have flowers in the garden, we're providing nectar uh, for beneficial. So our pollinators, the adults are nectivores. They're, they're drinking nectar and incidentally moving around pollen. Some of, them, some of them, the bees, use the pollen for their young and to feed their, their colonies. So they're really after the flowers. Uh, there are regular flowers that you see, but then there are other uh, nectaries that you can provide. Here's a, here's a uh, kind of a neat strategy. Um, Self-sowing annuals like calendula, borage, nigella, uh, they, they throw their seeds around and they just self-perpetuate and they bloom, they're blooming all the time. The nice thing about these self-sowing annuals that I mentioned, borage, calendula, nigella, so they don't get invasive. They, they'll go all over, but they're easy to to contain, they're easy to manage, they're easy to pull up. 
You might think about uh, co-mingling flowers with vegetables. So I always try to put some nectar sources next to the vegetables. Um, it adds be beauty, interest, and it, it ensures that pollinators are going to be moving all around my landscape, not just in the flower beds. And don't over tidy. Uh, it is not your living room. It is nature and nature is messy. So be sure to leave some places for habitat, wood chips, uh, some brush, uh, even some empty soil for bumblebees. Leave those seed heads through the winter for, for winter food, but also a lot of creatures will lay eggs or their larva will be uh, har um, harbored during the winter in old spent uh, flower stalks. Um, to keep them from spreading seeds all over, you can deadhead some of those, some of the ones that are most troublesome, but still leave the stalks standing. And then learn about pollinators. Uh, anything that flies or crawls is gonna move some pollen around. And nature is super complex. Lots of different things doing lots of different things all the time. So the more diverse you can make your garden, the more, the more creatures you can attract to your garden, the more like nature it is. And the more like nature it is means the more it's gonna take care of itself and you won't be, you won't have to do anything. So I, I, people often ask me, what are the creatures that I should invite into my garden? And I say, well, there really isn't like a one-way door. You have to invite everything to the garden and let them sort it out. Having said that, when you set up a habitat for creatures, you can't really tell, <laughs> you have to take the creatures. So um, in your handout, I put a book, uh, listed a book called Living with Wildlife in the Pacific Northwest. It's by Russell Link. It is the best book about creatures that I that I found. Um, it doesn't really cover insects particularly, but it covers everything else from birds to salamanders to um, uh, four-footed mammals. Uh, it, it really is great. It, it not only tells you how to attract them, but how to keep them out. And it really gives you a full, a full life cycle of the creature. So you know more about what's going on. So here are some pollinators. Hey, Lisa, hey. before we move into this, shall we do our poll to find out where people are with their gardening? We're going to do that. Oh, I forgot the first poll. <laughs> let's just do the, let's, let's look at pollinators and then I always forget those polls. Let me look at this and then we'll do polls one and two all together. Okay. Here's, here's some really great pictures of pollinators. Um, the hummingbird and bats. And well, it's not my favorite butterfly, but I did see one yesterday. The first cabbage white entered my garden. So all kinds of butterflies and moths, bees of all natures and descriptions, bumblebees. The, this is a surfid fly. So it, it's a bee mimic. Uh, it, and then there's a regular fly. They all they many of them are nectivores and move pollen around. And then our favorite. Uh, that cute little orchard mason bee. And you may see the houses or you may have an orchard mason bee house around. This is just a tiny little scratch of the surface. Here, I'll stop sharing and we'll launch the polls in a second. Uh, that's just a little snippet. Uh, there's all kinds of other smaller creatures, parasitic wasps that look like gnats. They move pollen around. Anything that's crawling, ladybugs, I didn't even put those in. Their, their primary goal isn't pollinating, but they do it because pollen is everywhere. It sticks everywhere. And they're crawling all over the plant. So the more creatures, the better. Just remember, as you look at the garden, 95 or more percent of the things you see that fly or crawl or slither uh, are beneficial or feed beneficial creatures. So they make soil, they eat, they eat uh, their predators or they their pollinators. Now I apologize because I uh, I am out of practice at this Zoom thing, and I have some polls. The first uh, we're going to go and launch two polls. One is like your experience level. 
Thanks, Shayla, for reminding me. And just take a, uh, we'll have a 30 seconds or a minute to fill that out. Just let us know if you're a beginner, a casual gardener, experienced expert, obsessed or passionate. Uh, you gardened when you were younger or you just, what, what's a garden? Yeah. All right, responses are coming in. So we're gonna um, just about, finished here. So just like two more seconds, guys, if you haven't responded to the poll, please get your answer in really quick because I'm going to end the poll right now. All right. Let's see go. what we are. All right. Well, this is great. Only only a small percentage don't even, are wondering what a garden is. Uh, that's great. Uh, we've got a couple experts and uh, lots of experienced folks. That's great. Um, well, welcome. I hope uh, I hope that this uh, helps you, uh, the beginners, the casual gardeners, to give you a little bit of a framework as you start to experience the garden. Um, a lot of people want to, you know, they want a real quick answer, but organic gardening it works, but it's a it's a long term investment. It's a whole bunch of things, not just one thing. So um, I talked about some different things about making a friendly garden, um, using, making a diverse plantings, keeping lots of flowers all the time, using natives, you, you know, eliminating pesticides and herbicides. You should just do that anyhow. Um, I gave you those tools for the checklist, that organic checklist, and um, thinking about creatures as they are in different life cycles and providing habitat and food for them, as well as learning about all the different pollinators so that you can rest easy knowing that anytime you see stuff in your garden that's a good sign so Sheila we got all we've got all those things those those different ways to uh make a pollinator friendly garden in the second poll just mark uh you know what kind of jumped out as something that you want to look at or focus on or do something uh about uh, as far as that, using a variety, wide variety of plants, eliminating pesticides, using the organic checklist, uh, including plants uh, for uh, larva, or learning more about pollinators. Go ahead and pick one of those that really jumps out at you as something that you want to try. Results are coming in, so we'll give everybody about 10 more seconds to think about right. what their priorities are here. Yeah, because sometimes not everything will resonate, but there might be something that you're like, you know, that's something. Yeah, that is a good, that's an idea. Okay, here we go. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Get your um, survey results in. I'm going to end the poll in two seconds. One, two, end. Here we go. Diverse plantings. All right. All right. That's great. I'm assuming since only uh, a couple people, you know, 2% eliminated pesticides that everybody else has already done that. Mm -hmm. How about that? That's, um, that's great. Uh, I am glad. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so uh, use those things. Keep those in mind as you progress through the season. When you're removing things or adding things to your landscape, just keep in mind some of those things. Uh, and, uh, you know, find a, find a great book that will, if you're interested in knowing more about pollinators, find some great bug books and start learning or get living with wildlife to learn more about the, the bigger creatures. Hey, I said I was going to tell you all about the, the plants that are easy to grow and that beneficial creatures love. And really, I am focusing on pollinators because the the um, the 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 decomposers, the soil builders, just want all your dead stuff, right? They they just want, they want you know old leaves, old plants, that kind of thing. So you've got that, uh, and the 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 predators really are after other creatures, right? So Cisco, if you want to know if you look at a creature and you're wondering, does it eat plants uh, and, and make soil, or, or is it a predator? Um, so decomposers move slow. They eat dead stuff. Dead stuff doesn't run away. 
So uh, if you see a little millipede, it'll be moving very slow. Its mouth is down uh, near the ground where it can eat. A centipede is a ground dwelling creature. You might see it in your compost. It is fast as lightning and it's got jaws that go like this. Cisco Morris always said, if it's got jaws like this, it doesn't eat plants. So if it has jaws like this, it means it's a good creature. It eats other creatures and keeps the balance. None of them are gonna eat you. So that's a good thing. I grew up in the desert where things actually were poisonous and dangerous. Here, the worst that you're gonna come across is getting flea bites from messing around in the grass. All right, here is my, the plants. So, oh, that's so beautiful. That is a yellow-faced bumbler. It's one of our native bumblebees and it's on the lavender. And, and that definitely is one of our plant families. I have organized these by plant families in no particular order. So we're gonna start with the onion family. So whether they're edible onions or ornamentals, uh, leaving some to go to flower will benefit pollinators. Uh, each uh, allium or onion family, this is a chive, the flowers are, the flower heads are actually multiple flowers. And each of those flowers is full of nectar and actually this chive flower, crunchy and delicious, sweet and oniony, so great. Toss it across your salad, but leave some and, no, and, and please don't worry when they go to flower. Those are actually great things for your beneficials. This is the, what a leek would look like. So I always leave a few. Uh, if I'm growing any kind of an annual or biennial uh, uh, edible onion, I'll leave a few in the garden and let them go to flower. Uh, they, th it's amazing the kinds of creatures that will come to all those different heads. Uh, um, a hummingbird has to visit all the different flowers. And look, I've, I've just given on one flower stalk, I've just provided hundreds of nectar sources. This is another little close up of the, the uh, of a spent, allium and you can see so the flower petals have gone and now those little round things will become the seed the cabbage family or brassicas that that's uh, broccoli cauliflower kohlrabi radishes turnips uh what else um mustard kale uh just all of the cabbage family the flowers are delicious for you and me and delicious for uh, pollinators. Uh, they, they are going off right now in the garden. Uh, kale and collards and all of those uh, 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 brassicas, they're biennial. So if they, if they made it through the winter, right now what they're doing is sending up flowers. You'll see a proliferation of yellow flowers uh, in the garden. Those will become seeds, but they tend to be some of the earliest flowering plants we have, and they're easy, right? You didn't even have to worry about it. They're just doing it. So if you have that going on in your garden, leave it. Uh, eat some of those flowers. They're delicious, uh, but uh, I've seen hummingbirds uh, drinking nectar from the collared flowers. I've seen all kinds of early bees uh, and early pollinators. So uh, before all of our summer flowers really start kicking in, it's nice to provide things for those, the early. Uh, this is a arugula, so delicious. So arugula is one of those ones that um, often will bolt and go to flower. Please don't worry and don't feel bad. Eat some of those flowers. They are delicious, but leave them because they are food and nectar sources for pollinators, it's super easy to provide. What, if you don't, if you, here's what I do, you know, like that's going to the flower right now. Uh, I want that space. I'm gonna let those flowers go until they're just done uh, and then I'll pull it out. So I'll, I wanna use that as long as I can as a nectar source for creatures in the garden. If I am going to grow it out for seed, obviously I just leave it go. But a lot of times some of these are sitting in places that I want to put in the next round of crops. And I just try to time it so that I get the benefit of those flowers and I can still keep on my uh, 
on my planting schedule. The carrot family, which includes carrots and parsley, uh, cilantro, fennel, dill, lovage, um, Queen Anne's lace. Uh, it is, is an umbelliferae, which means it's got an, uh, an umbrella shaped flower. It's one big umbrella, but each of those, those flower stalks has another little umbrella on it. So again, you're probably starting to get like, if, you, if a thing has flowers and makes flowers that really consist of hundreds of small flowers, that is good. If you haven't let a carrot family go to, see, to flower and seed in your garden, do it this season. I, always, I, I accidentally left some carrots in the ground one year. Uh, and they lasted through the winter. And then in the spring, they sent up a flower stalk like this. I saw so many creatures, soldier bugs, assassin beetles, all kinds of creatures that I never see in the garden. And they came to those big umble shaped flowers, those big umbrella shaped flowers. So here you can really see how each of those, that, that big umble is, consists of a whole bunch of small umbrellas all around. There's a little cilantro. So again, cilantro is another one that will bolt and go to flower quite uh, readily um, when things warm up or if you get them in the ground a little late. So uh, first of all, I wanna tell you that all parts are edible and they all taste pretty delicious at any stage. We, um, we tested, uh, we ate the, the cilantro greens. They were, for me, delicious. We ate the flowers equally delicious. We ate the green seed pods, pretty strong, but delicious. We ate the dry seeds, delicious. So uh, for cilantro at, at any stage, it's going to, if you like cilantro, it's going to be delicious, delicious. And here's some fennel. Uh, that's another, that's a great picture where you can really see those, those individual umbrellas. Um, and each of those little flowers is packed with pollen um, and packed with nectar. The pea or legume family, it, it's especially beloved of the big, heavy bumblebees. They, they, they are heavy enough to open up the flowers to get into the nectar. It's inside. It's way deep in the flower. That's where the goodness, the good juice is. So, um, uh, when you when you're looking at uh, the plant and you're like how uh, just observe they're usually the, the pollinators usually not dancing anywhere on the petals they're really focused on that deep in that center where there's just a little drop of sweet delicious nectar and you know you can you can definitely pretend to be a bee but not with the sweet peas. So uh, edible peas, as well as the sweet peas, which are not edible. We don't eat those, but they smell great. And they remind me that, you know, uh, scent is also a thing. So beautiful flower scents attract pollinators, but also uh, if, you, if you have a pear blooming in your yard or in your neighborhood, take a whiff smells like rotting fish or dog poop. So uh, <laughs> some of our pollinators are actually after carrion or things that are decomposing. So uh, your, your daisies aren't the most delicious and sweet smelling thing, but they attract their own set of pollinators. So having lots of different fragrance represented in your plantings, that's also going to invite the, the pollinators in. Uh, beans are part of that. I, this is a scarlet runner bean. Um, this is a great plant. Uh, edible beans, edible flowers, huge, tall plant, uh, loves to grow uh, vertically. So if you want something that's big and tall and spectacular that, that uh, will bring in hummingbirds, oh my goodness, I think you should just always grow a big curtain of scarlet runner beans. I have I've done that for years and it's just so fun to watch the hummingbirds, you know, protecting the area and feeding on it. It's it's like a little David Attenborough special right in your backyard. This is a vetch, which is another type of pea. 
look here. I don't know if you can see, I hope you can see my, my cursor, but I'm circling this little part right to the right of the flower along the stem. It's called a secondary nectary. And uh, so the flower itself does produce nectar, but on some plants, they also produce some secondary nectaries along their stems. So a vetch and fava beans are two that produce those secondary nectaries as well as uh, nectar from the, the flower. Clover is another legume. Um, so all, any kind of clover is gonna be uh, delicious for pollinators. Uh, you can grow an annual clover as a cover crop, that's crimson clover. This happens to be red clover, which is great if you've got a space and you just want clover because it really does like to move around. Uh, Dutch white clover, it's gonna be tall. So it's really quite magnificent when left to grow. Uh, it is a hay source. And so it's a source for animal food for animals, but all those little flowers on that flower, each of those, and you, you might remember as a kid or maybe as a, an adult acting, childlike, uh, picking off those little flowers and sucking the nectar out of that. Oh my goodness, so good. Uh, that is, uh, that is uh, uh, what the pollinators are after, that, that little nectar. Um, if you're looking for a clover that's um, lower growing, uh, it's a perennial, it's gonna spread, but um, if you're looking for something that you could grow that short growing that you could mow easily, um, maybe in between your, um, like your fruit trees or something, a Dutch white clover just grows about 10 inches tall. <clears throat> a, lot of or a lot of our commercial orchards will use clover as ground cover. They can just mow it and legumes of all kinds, fix nitrogen in the soil. So they're kind of self-fertilizing. All right. The sunflower family, <clears throat> hang on. <coughs> the sunflower family is uh, beloved by pollinators. It's these, this open nectary that, that uh, they love. All of that open center part of the flower is producing nectar. So here's calendula. This is one of our favorite self-sowing annuals. Uh, it flowers without you doing a thing. Comes in orange, yellow, uh, double, uh, has a dark center, a light center. Uh, they're so, one of my favorites. It's a medicinal, it's edible, it's self-sowing. Pollinators love it. I mean, what do you need? Blooms in every month of the calendar like little balls of sunshine. Okay, if you haven't heard of calendula before, you've heard of it now, just check it out. Include it in your garden. This is a beautiful daisy. So all the daisies are part of the sunflower family. This one is called a Zulu daisy. It's an annual. There's a little uh, cabbage white si sipping the neck from some yellow calendula. And zinnias are maybe maybe my favorite cut flower ever. Uh, they stand beautifully in the garden, which means they flower and they look great for a really long time. They're great, perfect cut flowers. They'll stand in a vase for a week or more. And all those open nectaries are beloved by pollinators. That's a little surfid fly, that hover fly. There are a couple hundred um, species of hover fly. The reason we like the surfid fly is that its larva, its babies eat aphids. They are massive aphid, aphid eaters. And the, the adults are pollinators. The pink family, and this is an edible family. Uh, Dianthus is part of this, uh, carnations. So um, there's a lovely carnation. This is uh, 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 a dianthus. I, I have some low growing dianthus and I, I always read it as a rock garden friendly plant and I never had much luck growing it in like rocky situation. 
I, I planted one in my garden bed on the on the end of one garden bed and it was just beautiful and incredible. So things like good soil, they like to grow in a, a good situation. Um, and there is sweet William. These are, per, most of these are perennials. So you plant them once and they come back year after year. They're great cup flowers. And look, just so many flowers really open, uh, full of nectar for our pollinators. So this is the family. I wasn't sure if this is an edible family or not. It's the teasel family and this is teasel. It's a weed. Uh, but it is a really spectacular weed. And you can see that surfing fly heading in to those flowers. So teasel is a is a like a, a field weed. Um, it's a biennial, so it grows a green floret close to the ground one year, and the next year it sends up its flowers. The we used to just uh, in the children's garden, we loved it. Uh, that cool pin cushion top was so cool. The leaves are connected to the stem and they form a cup. So you can water the plant and it will hold little pools of water all the way down. So we used to call it the fountain plant because we, we felt like we were providing water for beneficial creatures. Uh, and these light purple flowers, they bloom in a whirl from the bottom of that pin cushion up. So uh, here's the thing, it, it is going to produce, that pincushion is going to produce a whole bunch of uh, seeds, and those will make more. So if you, but they all release kind of at the same time, and it's pretty easy to knock the seeds out and collect them. So one thing you might want to do is to control your teasel spread by either collecting the seeds by knocking them out or deadheading um, the, those, those seed heads. Here's a more Here's a more cultivated pincushion or, or teasel family. This is a scabiosa or pincushion flower. Probably the most common is that light purple. This is my favorite. Oh, I just, I, uh, there's a couple of these um, burgundy ones. There's a big burgundy one, but this is a very petite burgundy one. Uh, and I, I just think that's fantastic uh, to see in the garden. Great as a cut flower perennial, good for beneficial creatures. What could you want? The buckwheat family, um, the, what you see here is an annual buckwheat. And that's the thing that makes those buckwheat groats that you use in the kitchen. Um, we often will grow it as a summer cover crop. Uh, it not only creates great uh, biomass for incorporating in the garden, it's a good summer uh, grower, it's quick. You can get a, a, a cover crop of buckwheat uh, in and out of the garden in, in a couple of months. So if you, you know, so for those of us who are growing year round, it's a nice thing to keep in a garden bed that we may be planting later in the season. Each of those flowers, obviously lots of flowers around those flower heads, uh, you know, preferred by a lot of the beneficial creatures and the pollinators. Um, there are others, though, uh, in that family, and sorrel uh, is part of that. Um, this is a this is a garden sorrel. So there's a there's a French sorrel. There's this beautiful. Uh, uh, it's got burgundy veins, or red, I think they call it red veined sorrel, um, and those are all part of the buckwheat family. And they those tall flower stalks with the flowers all along, very small, petite flowers, sort of indescript, you know, nondescript, uh, and then they'll create seeds all along that. And that, so that's why you have, if you, if you had one <laughs> red vein sorrel, now you have a lot all over. A lot of us think that's great. I love to see it growing up amongst my grass and other places. Some people are not going to want it all over. So again, you see it flower, you're watching the flowers, when it is 50%, if you keep it from spreading, this is with just about anything, when it's 50% in flower, 50 to 75% of the flowers are open, wait a couple days, cut the flower stalks off. Then you'll get it before it makes the seed and shakes its seed all around. Here is one of our most beloved of the buckwheat family. Can you tell what that is? 
rhubarb. Uh, if you have a rhubarb that has gone to flower, you, you will uh, appreciate that big flower stalk that opens up and produces all of those tiny white flowers. Uh, most of our rhubarb will not go to flower. It will go into a pie. The mint family, uh, it, it is disparaged uh, mint because it, it, you know, it propagates by roots and runners. Um, so it spreads. And sometimes that can be seen as a bad thing. If you like mint and want it in your garden, you don't, you can have it without spreading, put it in a container. Um, a mint will grow in a 10 gallon container for five or six years and then just peter out. It's sort of funny. Uh, it will be extremely well behaved in the shade, but in the sun, in full sun with some water, it's going to love it and it's going to spread all over. But when it flowers, look at all those little flowers going along that flower stalk. So the flowers are edible to you and me. They're definitely beloved by, um, by beneficials. So this is motherwort. The mint family is a huge family um, and not all of them are uh, spread by roots or runners. Um, uh, all of them create, create mul you know, multiple blooms on their flower stalks. And this is motherwort. Uh, this produces nectaries. So the, the flowers occur along the stem. And so having things that produce open nectaries and secondary nectaries along the stem allows us to have more diversity in nectar sources. So diversity, diversity, diversity is so important. It makes our uh, community strong. It makes our garden strong and resilient and healthy. So motherwort is awesome. It's a uh, medicinal uh, herb. Um, again, pretty easy to grow uh, and uh, great for women. Uh, it's a great woman's herb. A lot of uh, tinctures and, and other uh, herbal medicines or herbal tonics are used with motherwort. I think she's just stunning because she'll rise to be about six feet tall and just uh, uh, just has a real unique and powerful look in the garden. Monarda is called bee balm. It's part of the mint family. Uh, it's the flavor of Earl Grey tea. All those flowers are edible, so you can sip the nectar. You could toss those in a salad, um, make a cocktail out of them, uh, put them in your iced tea. It's a perennial. Uh, it, I like the red one. It's most stunning, but there's uh, there's sort of a, a violet one. And then there's the, the most common that you'll see uh, a lot of times is a sort of a pale purple, Monarda, called Bee Balm. This is, um, what is this? Oh, Nepeta. This is a, this is a cat mint. Um, cat nip never survives in my garden, uh, but cat mint, is a great uh, purple flower. Uh, purple and blue flowers are particularly uh, desired by pollinators. Um, and this comes in lots of different sizes. Uh, the Ten Hills Giant is, a, a, <laughs> as the name will, will indicates, a giant version of this plant. And by giant, I mean like probably six feet wide and five feet tall when it's at its full bloom. They have some smaller ones. Uh, smaller varieties, they're still a couple feet tall, but they're perennial. Deer don't eat, uh, rabbits don't eat them. Rabbits don't eat uh, nepeta, uh, but pollinators love it. And it, it's a great, uh, great as a cut flower, um, has a wonderful fragrance. Uh, if you haven't uh, included some something like this in your, in your perennial borders, this might be something that you could um, add. Lavender, rosemary, thyme, all of our culinary herbs belong with the mint family. It's a big, mint, big, big family. So there's lots to choose from and they all are beloved by pollinators. I, I think you should have some ground cover oregano in your garden. Use it, a ground, use it as a ground cover to cover um, soil 
in your perennial beds and let them flower. The flowers are beautiful, they're fragrant, they're great in a cup flower. And each ball of, each flower ball is hundreds of small flowers that, that provide lots of nectar sources for beneficial creatures. All right, real quickly, we're gonna launch, I'm gonna come back live when I, but if you wanna know more, if you like what you hear, if you like my style, join me at Garden with Lisa. So here is the, the last poll and it's, you know, what are the easy to grow plants that sort of stuck out to you? The stuff that you thought, oh my goodness, I wanna put that in the garden. I'm gonna rethink that a little bit. Oh, what was that pincushion thing? Now on your handout, I listed a lots of examples. So, and I gave common names so you could find them that way. Go ahead and mark as many as you, you know, as, as you want on that list. I, I'm the bearer of all the bad news today. You probably already know, but your favorite store, Stuberg's, is closing. I know. Did you hear that? They're cold oh. kids. <laughs> uh, I know. Or you get all your tools. Well, you know, I called I called them to order to get to go pick up like a, a case of Durapots mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. And they were sold out. And I was like, already? I think they've had a lot of trouble with the supply chain. Yep. Yeah, I got the I, I I read it along the way a couple months ago and I immediately thought, oh my goodness, Lisa, where's she gonna get all of her stuff between I know, her, I know the local garden shop at Stuberg's is like, what's going on with the world? All right. Uh, <laughs> okay, we're gonna end uh, the poll. All right. And share the results. Let's see. All right. Sunflower family. Good, nice, and some onion people. That's great. And peas, very good. So I hope that that gave you all some chance to, get, you know, all everything but teasel. I think is edible. I, I'm not sure about teasel. It's got like teasel itself has all kinds of thorns on it, so it must taste good to something, because otherwise it doesn't need thorns. People were asking who what we were talking about. Shayla, when before we went live, she was telling me all, I was like, Shayla, you need a new Facebook feed because she told me two <laughs> terrible stories about something happening. And then she was like, oh, I have more bad news for you. Uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, sources for gardening tools and supplies is called Stuber's Distributing in Snohomish. And they were a supplier for the landscape and horticulture industry, but they were open to the public. So it was a place you could buy really good tools that were you know super durable and you could buy them basically at a wholesale price so a 30 dollar thing was like 20 dollars, and so i always send people there uh but apparently they are they are another casualty of the last couple of years hey let's take a look i was going to look at the q a first okay. and see so somebody asked if uh, the cultivars for natives of the various Mahonia are uh, of equal benefit to wildlife. Okay, so that's a little bit of a question. I think that purists would, you know, I mean, we do want to be careful about hybrids. Uh, I think that the the cultivars of the of the the Oregon grape that bloom in other times of the year that gives us longer uh, nectar sources. Uh, I think those are going to be beneficial because they give us another option for winter or early, early spring blooms. But uh, with a lot of those like big double hybrids or they've hybridized it so it won't create very much pollen and won't be messy in the landscape. I, I will say it's better to stick with things that are a little bit more like the original than it would to be go way over there to these engineered hybrids. Uh, not GMO, but you know, like really like we want to make this hybrid so that it's not going to make a mess in your yard. Frankly, that's a pretty high um, <laughs> 
the requirement for a plant because plants are messy. Have you heard recommendations about dandelions? Are they so dandelions are part of the sunflower family? So pollinators love them, homeowners don't. They are early, early, early flowers. They're flowering now. They're part of the early palette. And there are pollinators emerging all the time as the weather gets nicer. Pollinators are emerging all the time. Beneficials are emerging all the time. The, the problem is that a lot of people apply pesticides to, to uh, dandelions. I like dandelions. I think they're little balls of sun. I know that they're important. Uh, if I wanted to, what I found is if my grass is healthy enough, I have a few dandelions. I don't have a field of dandelions. Uh, if, if I really care, I can collect the flowers. I can keep them mowed. And I tend to have not a ton of seeds spreading. But if you have a child, you've got dandelion seeds all over. Just going to happen because it's just too good to blow the seeds all over. And it's a great plant for teaching kids where the parts of the plant are. Are all flowers edible in, of vegetables? No. I can't say that. Somebody asked, are all flower, all the flowers edible of vegetables? I can't say that. Uh, you'll need to learn the ones that are edible. And I did, I, for carrots, you know, in the past, the root was it, like in the past, the root wasn't what we ate. Uh, of the carrot. It was the top and it was a pot herb and it was seasoning. I'm not sure about the flowers, if the flowers are edible or not. I'd have to look it up. There's a great website called Plants for a Future and they uh, specialize in edible plants. So you can look there. If you're going to do the internet, look for edu, o-r-g, things that, uh, um, things, uh, organizations that you can rely on to give you good information because anybody can put anything up on the internet. Can any of these plants be grown in the shade? Um, chives, chives will grow in the shade. Mustards don't, uh, and by shade, I mean they need at least five or six hours of, of sunlight. So um, mint will grow okay in the shade, not super vigorous. Most of these need sun. The pea family can tolerate a little bit of shade. Um, uh, what else? The cabbage family can tolerate some shade. I've got leeks and some shade. I've got some. Um, I've got some sorrel that's growing in the shade, but they they're still going to need like five or six hours of sun uh, to really be healthy. Um, Mint will grow in the shade, but just not very vigorously. So that's the thing. Some of them are going to exist and, and um, like, oh, lemon balm can grow in the shade and grow well. So you'll just have to kind of find the ones that, depending on what, what level of shade you've got. Um, get a quick seasonal list of blooming plants. Oh, phew. That's, uh, uh, I don't have that list. Somebody asked about a quick seasonal list of blooming plants. I, I don't have that list right at hand, but that's that's definitely something that I could um, uh, I, I would look up. Um, so you can buy the pea seeds to grow, or you can plant the transplant. Sorry, I don't have a uh, earwig. What's the earwig's place? Um, I think. They are, what are they? They are, um, they are not going to eat your plants particularly. Uh, they are much blind and they're creepy, but I think they're fine. Um, they're obviously going to provide food for some things, uh, but they're not a pest. They're just creepy. Uh, Russian sage is also part of that mint family. Um, where do most of the eggs get laid that produce butterflies? Depends on the butterfly. So insects are super specific. So that's why we want to create lots. We want to make a diverse landscape because insects are super specific. Uh, some butterflies only lay their eggs on certain things. Others have a wider range of plants that they lay their eggs on. 
So um, for swallowtails, I think that is the milk thistle, and so or milkweed. Um, so knowing about the creature and then learning about the host plants is the way we do that. Uh, I can say for sure that the cabbage white likes to lay its eggs on brassicas, or the cabbage family, um, and you can find those eggs. Uh, some are more, more general. They can lay it on several eggs or several plants. I am unable to control pesticides and tidiness in my garden situation. Any suggestions how to still? I'm not really sure. Uh, what that question is about controlling pesticides and tidiness in your gardening situation. So I think we, I need more before I can answer that one. Uh, how do I suppress, keep weeds out of my garden beds before the flowers start coming in? It's hard to sow seeds. Um, so here's a great, so somebody was like, what do I do? I have got my garden bed. I made it, cultivated it and I planted my seeds. How do I keep weeds out? Um, it's, it's good to know what a weed, what the weeds are and what the flowers are. If you're an, er, if you're, if you're less experienced, I would say use starts. That way you know what the start is and you know everything else is something other than the start. Um, but once you, once the plants that are growing that you want to grow are growing. Okay. So let, wait, 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 that's a hard, this is like that question, it's like an, an hour class, but here's a quick one. Let's just do it with a plant start. You planted a plant start, it's bare all around it. You water it, the weeds are going to come up. So you plant your plant start on top of the bare soil, put about a half inch of finished compost. Buy a bag of compost, that way it'll be weed free. It will, it will have been sterilized, so it's going to be not going to sprout cover the soil with the compost, finished compost, half inch, and it'll suffocate any weed seeds that are on the surface. And that will keep the weeds down. You can do the same thing with seeds. So you cleared the bed and you made rows. This is the, this is the only thing you're gonna have to plant in rows. That way you know where you planted. You're gonna make your two rows that you're gonna plant your seeds in, plant your seed. It, before you plant your seeds, cover all of the other area with the compost and then plant your seeds in the row and you'll know where the row is. And then the other will be suffocated. All the weed seeds will be suffocated under that half inch of compost. Living in a condominium, I have small garden space. I'm, I control. Oh, okay. Well, I think. That yeah, was, yeah. I, I kind of thought that was what it is. So in that, so C. Miller, I'm sorry that you're living in a place where the landscape is kind of being under siege. Uh, I think, uh, you know, finding out more information and always educating on one level, educating the condominium people and trying to make, that's one fight. You can decide to go that way or not. All you can really do is control your small area. And really, uh, you know, if you can keep from some drift, if you know when they're gonna be spraying, you could cover your plants with floating row cover. It's uh, the um, woven polyester fabric. It lets, it lets light and water through, but it would be a protection. And then you could either, you know, wash it or whatever. Uh, but really all you can do is control your small space. I understand the tidiness. So, um, because, you know, they're not gonna want dead plants. Uh, but uh, what you could do is um, use some tidy mulch or wood chips around your little area and just do what you can. All you can do is try to follow, like maybe not everything on the list, but you, if you can still be building soil, creating diversity, working with nature, if you can still do put right plant, right place, you still get the benefits of those. So were there questions in the chat that came there up? There were, but it's, it's 11.06. I think we probably should wrap up and then we'll come back to the really, there's a couple of really great questions in the chat. I think that would be fun for people. While, to you, while you do that, 
Okay. I'll look through and see what what are what's there Perfect. and come back. Um, okay. I appreciate everyone, uh, all 87 of you sticking with this. I hope it was beneficial for you. <laughs> and, you know, I hope that you're <clears throat> maybe given some tools to look at your landscape a little bit differently and that you'll uh, see, see uh, some things you may have been growing all this time as a, a greater benefit than ever before. So uh, if you want to learn more from me, check my website out, sign up for my newsletter, buy an online class, come see me at Mulbex. We'll be doing more with Kayla, I'm sure, through the, through the uh, season as well. So thanks, everyone. Now, no, that's a, for the winners. For the winners. Okay, so what I do, folks, is I use this handy-dandy random number generator on my phone. I know how many people attendance, and I have a spreadsheet of all of you attendees. So I just punch in a number, and I have 85 on this one, okay? And so I'm gonna look at my spreadsheet. And while I do that, uh, our winner this time is going to be Ann Bankson. And Ann, I'm so excited for you. You are gonna win the coolest water timer. This is on behalf of Cascade Water Alliance. And this is a game changer. You can go camping, you can take a couple of days away, go to the ocean or whatever you like to do and come back and your plants will still be alive. And I have even better news. I have this very same water timer and I was able to figure it out myself. So it's user-friendly, it's really easy. So you'll love this. So I'm gonna be emailing you for your address. I will have it mailed directly to you. So congratulations, enjoy your water timer. Okay, so our next two um, uh, prizes are from swag bags from Cascade Water Alliance as well. You're gonna get a, a nice white reusable bag with a reusable water bottle. And I like to always say, pinky swear you won't use plastic water bottles anymore after you get this lovely water bottle. It's um, dishwasher safe, it clicks onto things. It just is, fits down into a skinny purse. It's really a great water bottle. You'll also get a rain gauge, which I love. They're super fun for adults and children alike. I um, have these on my deck in my planter boxes. And when we get a huge deluge, like we've had about four yesterday, and go out and say, gosh, that was seemed like a lot of hail or rain or snow or whatever it was, and go take an actual look and see, what did we get? Did we actually get the inches that it felt like? So that's fun, really super fun if you have kiddos too, but it's fun for adults. And this is always good if you're up for a challenge. Um, this is a water shower timer, so you can make a goal to reduce the amount of time you spend in the shower. That saves water and it also saves a ton of energy. I know my hot water tank, is, I think, is my biggest energy suck in my house. So, anytime we're using less hot water, I save money, which I love. So, this is fun, especially if you have teenagers, give them a challenge, give yourself a challenge, see what you can do in four or five minutes. It's pretty amazing. You can do it. And this little tidbit will bring out your inner scientist. This, these are toilet dye tabs. So, if you have a toilet and you feel like or hear it running, and you're not sure, stick one of these in the tank in the back, wait about 15 minutes, and if the water in the bowl is blue, you've got a leak in your toilet and you're wasting perfectly good drinkable water and it's expensive. So use these tabs to um, detect if you've got a leaky toilet. So those will be coming to you again directly, uh, straight from us to you, to your house. So I will be sending an email to 41. Okay, that's Jan Chase. Jan, I'll be sending you an email for your address on where you'd like your swag bag sent. And I've got one more of those to give away. So that is going to number 45, which I'm seeing as Sean Fitzpatrick. So congratulations. And then Bellevue Nursery, as we've mentioned a couple times throughout the presentation today, is giving everyone a 10% off coupon for purchases. And I mean to tell you, they've got tchotchkes, they've got veggie starts, They've got plant starts. Um, Lisa and I just did a fantastic project there. They're super nice people to work with. Um, it's a beautiful place. It's like a secret. It's like in downtown Bellevue and you'd never know you're in the middle of downtown Bellevue. It's awesome. Oh, so check it out. If you're in the neighborhood, you'll love it. Maybe go online and peek around if you're out of town. You can use your coupon. Um, they're just really nice people. So I'll let all of you go. Thanks for being here. I want to invite you to, we have one final 
um, webinar next week on April 30th with Jesse Bloom. She's going to be presenting on weeds and water, wisdom for resiliency. So I hope to see you all back here for, uh, I know it's not an exact downtown Bellevue, but for people who don't go to Bellevue regularly like me, it feels like downtown Bellevue. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Before, but I hope we to sign out. Next week. Before we sign out, there yes. were two questions in the chat. Okay, and good easy to answer. Somebody asked about doc and you know I was wondering about that myself. I just went doc plant family on the internet and yes, it's part of the buckwheat family. Makes sense the way it grows, the way it looks, the types of flowers. Plant families share lots of common characteristics. The person with the cover crop, what I do is I chop it in. It, you've turned it under a little bit, cover it up and let, otherwise it'll start growing again. I'd cover it for a couple of weeks so that it will decompose and then you can plant into it, okay? So with cover crops, if somebody had grown a cover crop of clover or something over the winter, you chop it to the ground and then cover it so it's dark and it'll decompose. It usually takes a couple of weeks, but now's a great time because the soil's starting to warm up and the creatures are really having it. Somebody also asked, they, they see a lot of blooms around. They're not seeing a lot of bees. It's been a cold, cold, cold spring. And so I'm just starting to see things emerging. Never fear. Today should be a day where you see a lot of flying creatures on things. I noticed my mason bees are finally active. So, all right, everyone. Thanks for your nice compliments over there. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Uh, a great day in the garden. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. That was a lot of fun. I can't wait to do it again soon. Good. Thanks, Sheila. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.